As you mentioned 1958, that, that's the year that I got my uh, PhD and got hired by Jim. Uh, uh, throughout, uh, no one had heard of Jim Fusion until not many people had heard of existential psychology. I really just kind of lucked out. It, it would be nice to think that I, I wisely sought Jim Fusion tool and existential therapy and so forth, but I just needed a job. I was getting out of graduate school. <laughs> Uh, and I sometimes joke, uh, early in my life, I aimed for a career with the CIA and decided not to do that. And then I got offered a job at UCLA as a psychology professor and decided, I, for some reason, I chose, chose Vigital. So I got, I like to think this was a part of wise, deep planning on my part. I really just got lucky just to have to be at the right place. Like 1958, Jim, I'm still in the same office. Uh, Jim left me, but I stayed in that same building. How many years is that? 42, 57 years. Good. Thank you, John. Here's All right. A, here's a picture of Jim back in those days. Oh, yeah, this is from when? Tom, this is when? It's in the 60s, obviously. The 60s. <laughs> well, I haven't uh, spent uh, quite the same amount of time as Tom has in Jim's office, but uh, I have uh, Jim's office and Tom's office in my head. <laughs> I've been traveling with for 35 years. So uh, I thought I'd just begin quickly with a quote that I'll be following up on in my talk that is actually not from Jim himself, but it was one of his favorite quotes. And that is that psychology is a second-rate discipline. And the reason is that it does not stand in awe of its subject matter. He was talking mainly about American psychology. And that reverberated with me uh, since the time I met Jim, which was actually the uh, winter of 1980. So it's uh, coming on 36 years now. And uh, I certainly was in awe of Jim <laughs> when I first met him. And uh, to give you a feel for uh, Jim's uh, range of earthiness and uh, cosmic sensibility, uh, when I first met Jim, he was running around with Rollo May and uh, Stanley Krippner uh, in bathing suits, uh, jumping into hot tubs. <laughs> So uh, that was my first meeting with Jim uh, through the Humanistic Psychology Institute, uh, which is now SABRA. And uh, through uh, a quite rapid series of events, uh, I had the great fortune to uh, be asked by Jim and his wonderful wife, uh, Liz, to uh, be an intern for them at their low-cost counseling center called Interlog, which I did for several years. And I also had the wonderful fortune of spending uh, nine months in a mentorship program with Jim. And just quickly, uh, <laughs> Jim was my first instructor at the uh, Humanistic Psychology Institute. And uh, again, to give you an idea of the, the ranges of, of Jim's uh, way of being, uh, my very first piece of feedback for that course, that clinical course with Jim, was a postcard that I actually still have here, Humanistic Psychology Institute. Anybody can read it if, if they'd like to ask me to give it to them. Where, where Jim said that you're too good to write like a high school dropout. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I think I've taken those words seriously. And uh, well, it, it, it certainly put me in the awe of bafflement <laughs> and discovery. Um. I'm Molly Sterling. I first met Jim and Elizabeth in my own living room at the wedding of Mari Riley Kresge, who is now Mari Alexander. <laughs> and we both entered Interlog together. I have two things to say. One is Jim and I were coming back together from one of the Art of the Psychotherapist's week-long trainings. And we did this often. And he asked me my experience of something that had happened between us in public, and we hadn't talked about it. So I tried to tell him. I searched deeply, and I fixed, 
you know, explored and said things. And, and I said, well, I guess that's the end. And he looked over at me and said, there's always more. And that, to me, that's, I repeat that all the time in my life. And that is the core of Jim's leading you in his training, further, further than you know you could go, and then more than you are at that moment. So the other one is, is I want to pay tribute to Elizabeth Fugenthal, without whom there would be no Jim in my version of reality. She was an amazing person who held him and protected him and reformed him and kept him in line. <laughs> and uh, she, and she, she informed him with the wisdom that she carried that he needed. And I got to be part of that, too. It was wonderful. She was my first supervisor. Um, I was in uh, Davis, California and went to a lecture, and I met Jim. And I had been looking for why am I here since I was about 12. And I went up to him afterward and said, I want to work with you. He said, go to graduate school. I said, OK. So I saw him every chance I could, got to know he and Elizabeth. They came to my wedding. He was really like a second dad, including all the transference that happens with dads, definitely happened with Jim and I. And um, then he invited me to join him as a senior intern at Interlock. Um, what I can say about Jim is that he's with me every day when I'm with him. I've been a psychotherapist since then, 1980. And um, the idea of presence and really being able to stay with somebody. What's going on with them? I've, it's more robust now. I do attachment and interpersonal nerve, all this stuff. But really it boils down to, can I sit in the room? And can I be with somebody and resonate with them and help them get out of their own way? Which was one of Jim's phrases. The other was, what's the change agent? I still don't have an answer. <laughs> but I think it has to do with being present. Thanks. My name is Brian Wateen, and um, it was in uh, about 19, I don't know, the late 70s, where I was a student here, a graduate student here, and I called Jim because I wanted to go into therapy with him. And it was $80 an hour at that point, and he wanted to see me three times a week, and I was, just didn't have the money to do that, so he sent me to a, a student of his at um, HPI, Adele Schwartz, and I was in therapy with her for a period of time, but she said, no, you need Jim. <laughs> so um, <laughs> you can imagine whatever that means that you want. <laughs> but anyway, anyway um, so I was in uh, analysis or therapy with Jim uh, for, I don't know, three years, four years. I can't remember exactly how long. Um, I've written some papers about that, and I'm going to uh, offer that to you today um, on the dark night of the soul, which uh, Jim called the existential crisis. And um, uh, I had a profound and powerful idealizing transference onto him. And um, uh, what happened was that toward the end of the therapy, I, I, I was the first patient of the last day he was in clinical practice doing therapy. I don't know who the last person was, but I did meet her once. And um, one of the things that um, I was telling him at this particular time is that I would never leave him. And I, I was never going to uh, betray the existential humanistic stance and become something else and go somewhere else and learn something different. And he said, no, 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 no. You have to stand on my shoulders and see further than I do. And I just, the, the bottom went out inside of me uh, when he said that. And um, he gave me something that I think a, um, a magnificent father gives his son. Don't stop here. Go further. Go, go. And um, so I went off and became a Jungian analyst and, and different things as well. But... Um, I will never, uh, to me, his work, particularly the whole idea of inner searching, um, remains the, the cornerstone of my work. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pat LeClaire, and I have a short story about my experience with Jim. And uh, Jim did 
yearly for a long, long time, uh, a week-long seminar called The Art of the Psychotherapist. And um, this was my second year of being in The Art of the Psychotherapist, and I thought Jim was just the cats behind, and I wanted to be just like him. So we were doing dyads, and anybody who worked with him in those groups knows that whole thing. And I was uh, playing the therapist, and and then here comes Jim over and sits down on a chair and observes me. Yikes. So I worked really hard to get it right, and he said, stop. He said, what are you aware of? And so I listed off all the things that I was aware of going on in this, in this pretend um, therapy session. And he said, well, you got all the notes right. He said, you got all the notes on the musical score, but you missed the music entirely. And uh, I'm just going to stop there. <laughs> I'm going to stop there. In a nutshell, the reason we are here today is because of Jim. Um, We started, a whole bunch of us who studied with him way back when, went to all the courses of uh, psychotherapy, the art of the psychotherapist. Um, For me, it was the end of a long road of training with different master therapists. And here was Jim, and I wasn't as fond of Jim as I had been my other previous substitute parents, the Goldings, the Polsters. Um, And I had some disagreements with him, but lo and behold, he was the one who carried everybody forward who had studied with him to form the Existential Humanistic Institute. And he was part of it in the beginning. He helped us along and he fought with us and he encouraged us and he was there to support us. And so that's why I'm saying the reason we are all here today is because of Jim. Thank you, Jim. Hi, I'm Ora Krug, and um, the, I'm a part of the Existential Humanistic Institute as well, the clinical training director. Um, the first time I met Jim was 1977. I would just become an intern at a family service agency in San Leandro, and they had this marvelous idea of taking peop- uh, taking us around to different master therapists, and so one day, we had the marvelous experience of landing in Jim's office and studying with him for the whole day. And here I was. I had maybe been doing three or four hours of therapy by this time. <laughs> Very experienced. And I was astonished. I had never really encountered anyone who was able to mirror um, me because I was working with him in a way that I felt so seen and so held and encouraged to look within. And after that day, it was very clear to me, I said to myself, I have to learn how to do therapy in this way. And years later, I was able to find Jim and start working and training in the art of the psychotherapist with him. And his training inspired me to carry it forward. Um, All of the work and all of the training that we do at the Existential Institute really has the form and shape and the influence of Jim's work and his dedication and his vision not only of helping us learn how to cultivate deep attunement and presence, but also to how to create community. And one of the things that is true about today, right now, as I look around, there are my friends and colleagues who I've known for 20, 25, 30 years. That's another legacy that Jim has left us, that wonderful sense of how important it is to build community. And I think that's one of the things that we're trying all to do right now today. Hi, my name is Chris Armstrong. Go ahead, um, And Ora, you set it up perfectly for what I <laughs> want to say, of course. Because <laughs> I was thinking about um, Lou and I, 
friends who were married and had been and had working together for about 10 or 12 years, and we decided we wanted to deepen our work. And so we went looking, and we went to a conference that Jim was doing. Lou said, I know this guy, Jim Bugenthal. And we went, and we immediately wanted to be in consultation with him, but he didn't have any groups available. And I sort of kept my ear to the ground, and then one day I heard that he had an opening. And I swear, the minute I finished the session, I went in and called him and said, I know five, I have five people, I want to be part, make a group. So it was 1988, and we go, and what you set up was so perfect because as Jim started to work, I, I th was thinking in the, in the morning, it's like it was elegant and it was compassionate. And there was a way that every time the person spoke, he just noted it and caught the person and noted it and caught the person with so much compassion and so much depth. And I walked out of that and I looked at Lou and I said, I don't have any idea how to do therapy. And I, I, mean, I was just like, oh my God, I'm just crushed. And then I stop, I grab myself, and I go, well, wait a minute. He's been doing therapy longer than I've been alive. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I thought of a couple of stories. Um, we had the, thanks to Chris being the organizer, we had a consultation group, so we had the good fortune to be in consultation with Jim for many years. And... Um, what I recalled was, and it became a running joke in the group, we'd present a case, and Molly wrote her dissertation on this process, as a matter of fact. Um, we, we would present a case, and we'd be about three sentences into the case, and he'd go, oh, okay, 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 what's going on with you? <laughs> and the rest of the consultation would be learning something about ourselves in relation to this client, in relation to ourselves, it always helped. Um, Molly, I think you called it the meld, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and so I think one of Jim's, like, it's been mentioned here several times already, um, Jim was a, an enormously dedicated teacher, and I think he attracted people who were really dedicated to continuing to learn and grow. And um, he talked about it, you know, the whole thing was about being yourself and being as big as you can be, being as much as you can be, going as deep as you could into yourself and bringing that back out into the world. So um, Aura and Nader and we've, I, Sonia and there's other people in the room. Uh, out of these arts groups, we created a community of, of ongoing colleagues and it's a learning community and we're gonna be celebrating our 25th anniversary uh, this coming year. And, you know, the composition has changed. Some people have left. Some new people have come in. Not everyone at this point actually had direct contact with Jim. But that's a living legacy in my mind um, that he really kind of seeded that kind of a community. And it's been, a, um, uh, it's been totally formative for me. I mean, it's been a 25-year healing journey. I know he was kind of saying something about we're not about healing, but I would say for me, it's been, a, it's been a tremendous healing journey to be part of that group and have the support to um, basically, for those of you who know me, come out of hiding. So, thank you. Uh, I say ditto. <laughs> <laughs> Is, uh, I'm Bob Edelstein, and um, I'm uh, from Portland. I want to give a plug in case you're up there. For, I'm, I'm president of the Existential Humanistic Northwest Professional Organization, which uh, was inspired really indirectly from my connection with Jim. Um, is uh, I have two uh, personal stories that um, to me are in small way, like in his actions uh, exemplify Jim. That um, one was um, his uh, holding, as, as Aura was saying, his, his um, you know, he dealt with so many people and it always amazed me. I'm part of the 25 year crew. And basically, um, uh, he seemed, everyone seemed like, he, in not a lot of time, everyone had an incredible personal relationship with him. And, you know, I think that's quite incredible. And it would show up in terms of, it wasn't from, well, there, there was some dad and hero stuff, but, and he also was very uh, present with just wanting to be mutual, wanting to be him with you. And so, I know one time I got him a dessert, you know, at the, at the arts retreat. 
uh, one night. He made sure he got me to the dessert the next night. So, you know, that's kind of who he was, you know. Uh, <laughs> right. And then the other thing was his, of um, course, obviously passion for the perspective, but uh, in 93, through the Association for Human Psychology and Community, we brought him up and he did a weekend presentation. And, um, and then on his own, uh, without certainly us asking, we were pretty new, and he gave half of his, half of his uh, profit, half of his, what he got paid, to the community so we could prosper in the future. So thank you, Jim. <laughs> Good morning. I'm Ray Greenleaf, and I'm the retired chair of the Holistic Counseling Department at John F. Kennedy University, which includes the transpersonal, somatic, and integral specializations. And I'm here because Jim has been an inspiration for me. I never had the, I didn't have the privilege of working with him directly, but he did several conferences and presentations at John F. Kennedy. And I'm holding in my hand the Bible that we used for the past almost 30 years. We have used psychotherapy and process in our fundamental therapeutic communication class. And I have to say, I'm so glad that um, Jim told Brian to move beyond, to go beyond, beyond, because uh, Brian, he didn't mention, he became the first chair of the transpersonal department at John F. Kennedy, and I was one of the first students. So Brian, you've been a mentor to me and now a close friend. And that's the legacy that Jim has brought forth. There'll be a group of um, young professionals who were students at JFK and CIS who studied Jim's work, never got to really work with Jim directly, but got inspired by this. You can see that this is a dog-eared Bible for me. Um, and I want to just share one story that he told at one of his presentations. You may not know this, but Jim at one point said that he worked as a construction paver, paving driveways. You remember this? You've heard this story. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he's told. And what he said was that he learned about the tenacity and and the beauty of life just bursting forth from doing this. We go, oh, that's interesting. How'd that happen? He said, well, we would put down a layer of dirt and we'd have a roller come, put that down. Then a layer of gravel and they would tamp that down with a big steamroller thing. And then a layer of asphalt. And he said they would do this and then he happened to come back a few weeks later or a month or so later uh, to the site that they had worked on and he saw, breaking through this asphalt, a plant. And he said that was to me, him such a symbol of the struggle and tenacity of life. So he shared this at this workshop and it really inspired some students. And a month later I got a letter from some students, and I'll put this on the table out there, with pictures of a plant breaking through <laughs> asphalt. So. The legacy of Jim is to break through. So that's my story. Well, I'm Ken Bradford. And I guess I'll just say that as uh, Rollo May's book was to Jim in terms of opening his career to him, Jim's book, The Art of the Psychotherapist in 1987, was to me. Although I'd been studying a variety of things up to that point, like focusing psychoanalysis and so forth, once I encountered the book and then encountered the man, I never looked back. Um, it wasn't that he gave me the words uh, like Rollo gave Jim the words. It's more that he gave me the permission, gave us also the empowerment to not use his words, but to always find our own words by daring to be present in the moment with people in this just incredibly direct and unhesitating uh, manner that is, uh, it's an ongoing legacy. I see it actually as a lineage of awareness, relational awareness. Uh, hello, my name is uh, Elena Mazur. I live in Russia and work in Russia and came from Russia. Uh, so, um, I want to share my experience being with Jim. I consider him as uh, my teacher in psychotherapy. I have heard about him um, from early eight 90s, 
and we did the program uh, of existential humanistic approach in Russia with Nader, who came to Russia and teach us Bujental approach. And he, uh, uh, Jim consulted our program and sent material and uh, we were very interested in his approach. And personally, I have met him in uh, the conference. Uh, it was in 97, and many of my colleagues are present here. I'm very happy to be here and meet them. And um, uh, it was a very, um, very important event for we were a group of Russians from Moscow and St. Petersburg who came to teach with Jim. And we admire his work, his approach, and his personality, of course. And uh, for me, I remember uh, the, some point, which was very important, he told that for therapists, it's important to know that very pres only present exist, and also uh, let things happen. So just let the process goes, something like this. And so uh, then, uh, I met him in his office and he consulted our program and we think how develop this program in Russia the best way. And I remember very uh, one personal moment experience with him which touched me deeply and um, I like have the personal experience of his presence. It was a difficult moment in our conference, some problem uh, with organizational staff, some misunderstanding and why I was upset and I don't know how to solve this. But Jean, a uh, very delicate, look at me and say, said, Elena, are you okay? Is everything good with you? I was so deeply touched because it was so, so delicate, so respectful, in distant, just few words. And it helped me just to change the state and just to open and solve this um, misunderstanding. Uh, so um, in Russia, we uh, know Jim and we develop his approach. And uh, the main um, uh, the main lesson is like being present, being in the process, and uh, meet the client uh, in very deep place with respect and admir admiration. Thank you. Hello, I'm Louis Hoffman. I, I first met Jim a little bit after his stroke, and I remember at first being really disappointed that I didn't get to meet Jim before his stroke. But much of that quickly faded. And I remember it was in a training with him with quite a few people. And uh, he told a joke that he told a number of times where he said, you know, I spent my entire life talking and teaching about the here and now. And now that's all I'm left with. Because his short term memory was impacted. And after he said the joke, he smiled with that with the smile that Jim has that those of you who know Jim know that smile that's very infectious and heartwarming. And then just a few seconds later, he sobbed, right there in the middle of the group with all of us. And with both of them, there was no shame, there was nothing, except for authenticity. And that just impacted me so much that he really did live it. And so I knew that I was still meeting Jim as who he was. He did a demonstration a little bit later that day, and he would do these hour-long demonstrations, and by the end, he couldn't remember the beginning of it. But they were amazingly powerful yet. And I got to sit right behind the person who was doing the demonstration with Jim and see his face. And I remember afterwards saying, you know, you do more psychotherapy with your face than most people do with everything that they bring. And that just really struck me. I don't know if Jim spent much time doing poetry, but that's something that became really important to me and I think Jim really influenced in me in some ways. But whether or not he spent much time with poetry, I know that he lived it. He taught us how to find meaning and value and all kinds of things in the pauses and the line breaks and the, the speeded up pace. But that's, I think, one of his great gifts is finding meaning in all of those different places. Thanks. Hi, I'm Candace Hirschman. And I, I only met Jim a few times as well and it was after his stroke. Um, I was struck in the same way Lewis was by the incredible amount of presence. And I knew Elizabeth, who is a poet, as well as myself and um, Karen, their daughter, is a very dear friend of mine. Um, I think what I want to say right now is I really know Jim Bugenthal's work through the existential 
Humanistic Institute board and um, all of those people who I've worked with and trained with. Um, and, you know, I almost didn't come to this because I'm so busy and I work with a lot of these people, you know, through email and things like that. And I, I decided I really have to get here today. Um, I think about Jim's metaphor for presence and getting there and the dance of the seven veils and the dropping of the veils. And I realized as I was over there that for me, showing up today is dropping a veil. It's getting to be here with the people who I, I love uh, in a way that I really don't very often get to experience them. And it, it sometimes takes away from remembering who we all are and how much I love these people. So that's how it shows up the most for me today. Um, how it shows up in my own work. Uh, I did my dissertation research on disciplined poetry practice and its uh, impact on the capacity for presence. Um, and of course, Jim's work is part of that, but what got me there was my own capacity for presence and using poetry as a tool, as a means of getting there. And I remember um, I got to visit their home uh, when Elizabeth was very close to passing away. And I was sitting in the kitchen with Karen talking. And I looked up. And on the cupboard, there was a poem about bowls. <laughs> I loved it. I mean, it was such a lovely poem. And uh, to me, that's what poetry brings to presence, is a, just a way of seeing the more in things that we really take for granted, like a bowl or being in traffic. It opens us up. And um, that was what brought me to my topic. I mean, it's an interesting topic, but really it was having these kinds of experiences is what inspired me to want to bring more poetry, really wanting to bring more presence to the world in that way. Um, and I guess I'll close by saying, to me, presence is love and God. And that's how I see it, and it's a way to get there. So that's how I see Jim's contribution. So thank you. I'm really happy to be here to see you today. So um, I'm Troy Pavarsky, and uh, I'm, among the, I'm among the people here who haven't had any uh, direct contact with Jim. Uh, but in some ways, it, it, it doesn't really feel that way uh, to me, and just kind of listening to uh, everyone's reflections who have you know, uh, the, the privilege of, of working with, with Jim. And I think that that, I, that feels that way because um, because of the power of his legacy through um, my mentors, uh, Aura and Otter, Kirk and Sonia. Um, and uh, so it's been just a, a wonderful uh, privilege to, to work with them. And, and uh, I think for me, the thing that stands out when I think about, um, when I think about Jim specifically, um, the thing that comes to mind most is uh, that he helped me kind of translate a wonderful philosophical perspective from something that was kind of an intellectual enterprise into something that that's very alive and uh, that that um, gives us a chance to really uh, have an encounter. And uh, so, I think that's what what sticks with me uh, the most. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Vincent Sinkavich, and I, too, am one of the people that have never directly encountered Jim, but I will tell you about the first time I got turned on to his work. It was actually during the year of my graduate studies in which I was taking my competency exam, and, of course, I was found slightly wanting, so having to do, um, and I found myself having to do a revision in order to fully pass one of the terms of my revision was that I had to read um, a book by Jim Bugenthal and work, I believe it was, I can't remember what it was called, it was the book that was being shown earlier, Psychotherapy and Process, thank you. 
So I had to read this book and incorporate it into my new draft of my competency exam in order to fully pass the thing. And at first I was kind of cursing the fact that I didn't pass it right out in the first point. But, you know, it turns out it was one of the better things that happened to me because that book really touched me and opened up my view of uh, what therapy could be, you know, from more of a mechanical kind of just knowing the answer and being there and, you know, guiding people down the path to something that's a lot more evocative and a lot more connecting, a lot more, I guess, process oriented, you could say. So I continued my work uh, both through the Pacific Institute uh, as well as through being a student with EHI. And I think the biggest thing that I have learned from just my experience with Jim Bunital's work and the people that he taught and inspired is that anyone can learn to do a therapeutic intervention. Anyone can learn to write a treatment plan or, you know, do a behavioral tune or anything like that. The real trick to therapy is learning how to be with people. And that's what Jim really spoke to and inspired. Thank you. I was visiting Jim and talking about his life and career and kind of praising him for the books and so forth. And I always remember Jim looked at me and he said, words, words, words. <laughs> so that's one anecdote. Uh, toward the, at the very end, the story that I heard, he, ha he had his stroke and they were waiting for the ambulance to come. And the dog, Dickens, <coughs> touches me, I like dogs. The dog, Dickens, got on the bed with him and stayed with Jim until uh, everyone's got there. So there's a nonverbal part of Jim also that we need to, to honor that way. I'll just read a real quick poem uh, for Jim. Authentic persons everywhere, be empathic, show you care, transcend your existential guilt, don't let your will to meaning wilt, turn off TV, forsake them all, come honor our Jim Butenthal. Though he has been here eight decades, his brilliance never dims or fades. It's he who guides us straight and true, who sees the soul in each of you. But who's behind those books of his? It's not some wizard, no, it's Liz. <laughs> so let us cheer and celebrate those lovebirds whom we think are great. Thank you, Tom. That was a great ending. So we have uh, a few minutes that we thought we open up for questions um, to our panel that's sitting over here. Um, part of the, but you know, everyone can maybe answer. We have a roving mic. So if there are some questions in the audience, oh, you have them. You need to push down the, the button. Are there any questions? Answers? I am extremely thankful and really deeply touched by um, all of your uh, sharings and testimonials about your work with Jim. I'm also one who has been touched by his work uh, indirectly uh, through one uh, of his students, Ken, and also Ray. But it's been so wonderful to hear from all of you and to see how his work uh, is being, has affected all of you, and seeing how it's been manifested in so many wonderful ways. And uh, yeah, sort of like seeing through, sort of like light coming through the prism and radiating in such a wonderful way, and the rainbow. Uh, that you are offering to all of us. It is so deeply appreciated. Just really thank you for allowing uh, all of you to share, share this with us. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much for saying that. I appreciate that. I, yes. oh, oh, I have yeah. one little plug I would like to get in, and that is please do join us for social hours this evening. Um, we have really a wonderful um, skit that Nada mentioned earlier, and it will warm your heart and make you smile. So, um, I want to thank you all. I just arrived last night from Europe. I am a trainer, an existential trainer in Greece. And uh, um, I was really moved. Uh, this year I'm teaching Jim Bugenthal. And um, 
the here and now is happening for me here. Um, as Vujental and Rollo May brought uh, the um, growing part of, of uh, existentialism, Europe was in war and it was dark and it was pessimistic. So it's the American way, uh, the American school of psychotherapy, which is bringing hope in existentialism. Uh, by the way, it's a favorite of our students. When they study Heidegger, they all say, oh, again. But when we study Yalom, Schneider, Ora Krug, uh, all the books that we have translated into Greek, they're also um, positive about it. Well, coming to what I was saying, I don't want to keep your time. It's, again, I come from a continent that is nearly in war and um, with very dark side, although I'm an optimistic person. And now it's as if I am um, trying to get the good side of America to bring it to Europe. Mm -hmm. And I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for, for the, well, to the whole panel. And that was actually exactly what we were hoping to, to uh, achieve. Thank you for speaking so eloquently about that. We wanted to show really that, that uh, Jim's work is alive in us. This is not some abstract, uh, you know, dust on some book uh, uh, um, issue here, but rather it lives in us and we are passionate about it. I love how people talked about community building, really the connection that, um, that brings us together. And I hope that this, uh, this weekend for you will be one where you can meet up and, and be, be who you are. That's, I think, the, you know, sometimes not the easiest thing to do, but, you know, if you can practice this weekend, it'd be great.